Before we can fully start understanding dynamic range and how to manipulate dynamic range, we first have to know some of the different parts of what make up an audio signal. So in this video, we're going to go back to the basics and just get a brief refresher on the different parts of an audio signal and see some of the different ways that we can view that audio signal. So one of the most common ways that we view audio in a computer is by its waveform, and these are typically viewed on a waveform display. Your typical waveform display has a line through the center and marked by an infinity symbol. This is called a zero crossing, but it also represents the absence of signal. Above this line, we have the positive swing of our audio signal, and below this line, we have the negative swing of our audio signal. In an electrical sense, our audio is an alternating current, meaning that the vibrations of our audio create voltage in both the plus side and the negative side of an electrical signal. The speed at which it fluctuates from the plus side to the negative side is called the frequency, and these frequencies represent pitch or tones in music and sound. So the more fluctuations in voltage we have during a given time period, the higher the frequency or the higher the pitch. Now time on these waveform scales occurs from left to right, while amplitude or volume is determined by how far our signal swings away from the zero crossing. But that's more on a microscopic scale, and we don't typically think of audio as an alternating current. Most of the time, we view audio like this. When we take this overview, we start to see what are called envelopes. And you can think of an envelope as kind of like a tiny little package to squeeze all of your audio into. So we end up with these generic shapes like little blobs of varying sizes that we end up working with. Now, our transients are the loudest part of our waveform. You'll see sharp transients on sounds that have a snap or a pop, like drums or the pluck of a bass guitar. We can think of this initial transient as the attack, or the beginning part of an audio signal. Now after the attack, we have the decay and the sustain, which is the part of the audio signal that's held at a given volume. This is most easily seen in a long vocal part. And finally, we have the release. The release is the part of the signal that tails out into silence. And as it tails out into silence, it gets closer and closer to our zero crossing at the center line. Now, if we take this same thing and look at a standard digital peak meter, we can view the position of these peaks in real time as our audio plays. Now, the peaks are a loudest point of the audio signal at a given point in time. So we can actually have peaks on both the positive and negative side of our audio signal. And our peak meter just shows us the highest peak at that given point in time, regardless of whether it's in the positive or negative swing. But there's another type of meter that we use often in the studio that gives us a slightly different measurement, and that is the VU meter and RMS meter. Let's take a look at a digital RMS meter. RMS stands for root mean square. Now, without getting into the nuts and bolts, this meter just gives us a special average of the loudest parts of our audio signal over time. Because audio is a continuously varying signal, there's a lot of calculation that goes into figuring out these averages. So it's not always going to be showing us the highest and lowest values, but rather an average of those over a given period of time. So these meters are often a little bit slower to respond, but the best part about them is that they give us an average loudness level to refer to. On outboard analog equipment, many times you'll see VU meters or a volume units meter, and this behaves similar to an RMS meter, where it will only show us the average loudness level over a given period of time. Now we'll be using all of these meters throughout the series, and since each of them perform and are calibrated at different levels, just keep that in mind when we start learning about compression. Now especially with the older analog style meters, these measurements are often a little bit imprecise, so we may tend to rely a little bit more on our ears than our eyes. In the next video, we'll be learning all about dynamic range and headroom, and we'll see how this all ties into metering and compression. We'll see you in the next video.